is introduced, my name is Cody Reeves, and let me say it's interesting to have, it, interesting and, and very welcome to have the audience praying for you before the job talk. <laughs> Having been in several job talks with Frank Schmidt, I don't know if any of you know him, he's notoriously cantankerous, um, and this is a very different setting, so so thank you for that, and, and thank you as well for, for your generous hospitality. It's, it's been a wonder meeting with you today and learning more about, about the wonderful things you have going on here at BYU, um, both the students, uh, amongst faculty, I'm very impressed, um, and so I hope I can equally impress you in sharing some of the work I've been working on. Um, you know, credit as we as we get started. This is a project that I'm heading up with Ian Crawford, um, and then we also have a couple other people who are helping us along the way: uh, Greg Stewart, um, Stacy Astro, and Samantha Solomayo, um, in smaller roles. Um, but Ian and I have headed this project looking at the effects of team network structure on system performance, um, and so just. Agenda, kind of where we'll go today, I want to give you just a brief background about myself, um, what drew me into the field, and a large part of what has me asking the questions that I'm asking uh, and driving my research. Um, talk about that, the way research streams and how it's coming together. Um, and then we'll talk about this project looking at healthcare team network structures. Um, and then some future research ideas. Um, ideally, if there's time, we can uh, dip into my dissertation there, talk about where the, what direction is that headed and the data I've collected so far. Um, so with that said, when I graduated from the Marriott School in 2008, um, I was able to land a job as an HR manager uh, for a, a mid-sized construction firm in Lehigh, uh, about 150 employees, and I had a chance to really get my hands dirty um, in a lot of things I never expected I would be doing at work. Um, I mean, federal compliance with large federal contracts, dealing with employees who were making specific death threats against others. It was, it was a very wide range of experience, and it was a company that didn't have an HR department before. Um, they'd scattered the function amongst people. And so my role was to create it and basically wear all the HR hats. Um, so gained a lot of experience. And one of the great challenges that we faced there, um, when I came in, I wanted to get a sense for what had been going on at the organization. And I looked at some of their turnover rates and, and what was happening with hiring and found that within the first 90 days of hire, they had a 70% turnover rate. Which you can imagine, it's like hiring into a bucket without a bottom. They were, they were losing just about everybody they were bringing in. And so having recently read um, Jim Collins' Good to Great, of course, my first natural instinct is we've got to get the right people on the bus. So the first part of my work there was focused very much on, on the selection process, on recruitment, getting the right people and having a sound selection system to find those who are more likely to thrive in the setting in which we were in. But then I noticed as well, so one, one key example that stuck out to me, we hired this, uh, this gentleman who was used to finishing concrete in Alaska, where it's about 30 below zero, freezing cold, they put up these tents and finished concrete. Very skilled at what he did, used to very hard work, and so you know we brought him on board, he was very qualified, and I always follow up with the, their foreman after the first couple of days to see how this person doing, get a quick review and, and gauge their progress. And I called the foreman and, and heard what every HR manager wants to hear, and that, wow, this guy is spectacular. This is one of the best employees we've ever had. This, this is a great job. And you know, of course, grinning from ear to ear, of, oh, thank you, you know, I, th I think he's great, we'll try and find more like him. And a couple of weeks down the road, he was moved to a different project for some work needs. Uh, and when he got there, after the first day, I got a call from the foreman there saying, this is one of the worst employees we've ever had. What is going on here? Why are we hiring people like this? And so I learned very quickly that beyond just getting people into the organization, there's this idea of where they're placed within the organization uh, and these team dynamics as well that have a large influence on whether they succeed or not. So in my doctoral program at the University of Iowa, my research teams have coalesced around two major ideas that are starting to, to come together in a single stream. Um, first, when I first arrived, my focus was on organizational entry processes. Um, so we're looking at employee selection, what makes an effective selection system, um, looking at physical ability sex differences. Um, so links very closely to construction work I've been doing. Um, I've also done a couple of chapters looking at recruitment research, summarizing that, offering an update for the field. Um, and I also have a project that, that's continuing with data collection. I presented at SIOP this year looking at how recruiters judge the fit of applicants and what might cause them to focus on some characteristics rather than others. So the early part of my research was focused largely on this stream. Um, I'm still continuing with it, but I've moved on now um, to team settings as well, um, looking at what is it that helps teams to get along well, also helps them to be more productive. Um, we'll talk a bit about one of those projects here today. But these ideas of, of entry into the organization and then the team processes are now coming together um, through my dissertation and other projects on this idea of effective entry into teams. So when individuals become a member of a team, what are some of those early processes or early key moments that can really influence you know, whether they have an appropriate impact on the new team and vice versa, whether the team has an appropriate impact on them and how they, they work together and become effective. Um, 
So today we'll talk, we'll focus on this team system that was structured paper and then hopefully at the end get more to the dissertation um, and just talk about the, the broad idea and where we're at with that. Um, so AMJ earlier this year, um, they had their letter from the editor uh, talking about this importance of context. Um, you know, we identify key problems that exist in the real world and give a good description of context in our papers. So I'd like to start with that a little bit in talking about where the research was performed, and that's the VA health system. Um, you've seen it in the news lately. They've got a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties right now. And ultimately, you know, not entirely surprising, it's the largest healthcare system in the U.S., um, comprised of just about a quarter of a million employees, um, spread across 150 large hospitals uh, and an additional 820 smaller outpatient clinics. Um, geographically centered, they put, you know, there's usually a hospital with some outlying clinics that are associated together. Uh, ultimately in charge of the care of nearly 6 million patients. So you think first of how complex healthcare is, add to the fact that there's that many patients. It's large work they're doing, it's very complex, and they have a lot of challenges. Um, and something they've done the last few years in an attempt to try and help these veterans more is they've moved to what people call patient-centered medical homes. Um, the acronym they use is PACT, uh, patient-aligned care teams. The idea being that, so before, it was you were assigned to a doctor as a patient. You would always try and see your same doctor, and the rest of the staff that saw you, you know, the registered nurses, the licensed practical nurses, the clerks that helped out, it was whoever was available. You know, you just grab people that were open and they would come help. There wasn't continuity with the rest of those team members. And so the VA in 2010 made a switch to this team-based model where they said, look, we're not just going to have the doctor assigned to people, we'll form them in these teams and have all of the different team members assigned to this panel of patients. Generally, panels are about 800 to 1,200 patients. And that way, not only do they have continuity and do they know their doctor, they also know their nurse. You know, they know both the nurses, they know the clerk, they can have this continuity of care. The relationship between the patient and the team is absolutely key, at least in the model and, and what they put together. And so the four core roles that are made up in every team, and I've, I've mentioned them, but just you know, as a recap, so a healthcare provider, which is your standard doctor, um, it could be a licensed practitioner nurse, somebody with you know, the most training to actually direct healthcare. Registered nurses, which oversee the day-to-day -day care. Um, you know, a lot of you know, minor things that are going on. They're kind of that, that first line of defense. The licensed practical nurses, uh, who are the ones actually putting in the injections, um, actually checking the readings and reporting back to the registered nurse. Uh, and then a clerk, who's in charge of keeping records, keeping track of things, and how the process is coming along, making sure they have accurate records. So that's the setting that we were able to join the VA in. Jeff, is the provider a generalist, or for more complex situations, do they have a specialist? Yeah, Does that matter? Yeah, good question. So in this case, we're looking at primary care teams, and so these are all generalists. Um, the specialty care is a different segment of the hospital. We'll talk. We'll get to a little bit about kind of how to interface and interact later. But yeah, as you think of this, this is all primary care. So when you go for your checkup, this is who you're seeing. Uh, specialty care, they coordinate, but yeah, it's offered through somebody else. So does the same set of four individuals stay together for a large number of people? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the goal, and that's the idea, is that you have these four team members who, they oversee the care of, of about, well, ranges between 800 to 1,200, um, 1,000 to 1,200 is what they're hoping for, per team. So these four people would have entire charge of the care of, you know, 1,000 or so people. And that's their panel of patients, and they see them when they're at the hospital, ideally they're calling them, even when they're not in, to follow up and see how their health's doing and offer them tips. Um, but yeah, they become in charge of the care of that group of patients. And ideally, they're always seeing the same people. Great. So, yeah. You know. I'm sure everyone's thinking this, so I'm just going to ask it. Um, how difficult is it to get them to falsify records so that your research turns out the way you want it to? <laughs> <laughs> the VA falsifying records. No, yes. Um, so, so, for example, with the, the recent scandal, right, this idea that people were, you know, marking down, you know, changing records to show that people were getting care in a timely manner when they weren't. Um, so, nobody's kept a closer eye on this than me. I read a lot of the government reports about it. And ultimately, and, and it's a concern, and there's one of our variables in particular that I would say, you know, we'll take it with a grain of salt a little bit. Um, ultimately, it's relatively small scale, um, less than one-tenth of our sample. Um, in less than one-tenth were problems found. Um, and so they did a pretty thorough audit, actually a two-round audit on every site in the country, um, pretty thorough in trying to find out where the issues were arriving. So, yes, there's some potential issues there, um, and actually as a side project, which we're curious to see the findings. Well, if we found the findings, I can't report them to you at this point, unfortunately. Um, but the way teams are structured also predicts which places were flagged and actually found for having these practices. So while we're looking today at how the structure influences performance, there actually are some implications for ethical performance and engaging in these counterproductive work behaviors. Um, at some point, will you be able to 
publish on that? I'm optimistic. We're, we're, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're worth it to you. He'll do it. Yeah, on that one, we're, yeah, we're waiting for clearance from the VA. They're still looking at it internally, but we hope to it one day. We, we think it would make a, a great paper. Um, it's a very, to us, it's a high impact finding. So when it does, you'll be the first person I call. Right. Yesterday, Jeff mentioned that most research is in some way autobiographical. I'm just wondering if questions are also <laughs> autobiographical. <laughs> find out how you can get away with it. Um, so ultimately, it's the large question we approach this research with is, so the VA is pushing for this four-person team model. You know, and that's ultimately the core of it, is that you have each of those people present. Our question is, though, but how do you structure teams within a system? So, I mean, you don't just have one team at a facility. You have multiple teams. How might you structure them differently to get the best outcomes? Uh, one model that you might take is this idea of small, independent, autonomous teams. You have these four people. They all work together. They're a team well, you know, at all times, and that's it. Another way you might structure the system to help with some crossover, you may actually interlink some people. So a couple people are members of multiple teams. So when the workflow in one's a little bit higher, somebody else can step up and help a little bit. You can offset those ebbs and flows. When somebody's absent, you have a little more coverage to set up there. Um, so oh, there's just two decisions of, of ways you can structure it, and, and a lot of variants on this. But this high level, that's what we're curious about, is when you have lots of teams within a system, each of which is performing a discrete task, you're working with a single panel of patients, how should they be structured? Should they be interrelated or should they be autonomous and independent? And ultimately, you know, the research, the Church of Marx point out, we don't know a whole lot about this at the system level. Um, now, since they published that, there's been a stream of research on um, multi-team systems, um, which is distinct from what we're doing here. Um, the multi-team systems research looks at when you have multiple different teams, each of which is completing a facet of a task. So you have, you know, one team that's on the ground in the Army and one team that's working on the radar. You know, ultimately, they work together to perform a task. The multi-team systems literature has looked at that, but not at this idea of linkages and joint synges between teams that are actually working on independent pieces of work. Um, and so the, the primary theories that we've looked at for informing you know, why one might be superior over the other, socio-technical systems theory, uh, originating from Tristan Bamford's work in 1951, was offered as a bit of a counterpoint to Taylorism. So Taylorism, we have this push towards absolute efficiency. You know, what's the absolute minimal motion you can do to complete a task? How can you organize individuals to do it with the, you know, the absolute top speed and with the most accuracy? When Tristan and Danford, uh, were implementing a Taylorist system in a coal getting plant, they found that uh, although they were implementing these, uh, these systems that should have made it more efficient, it wasn't working. Um, and the, the reason they found for that in their research is that for the individuals, suddenly they lost um, the fact that they can identify with a complete task. Um, so it's not just, I'm going to be the person who's getting the call and passing it to the next. But before, I mean, there were teams that were actually completing a full body of work together. Uh, they also had lost control over the way to perform the task. And they'd also lost control over the boundaries around them. So this notion that there were external forces now, when you're just this person in a line pulling it out, when there's an external force or somebody else vital next to the system, you can't control that. Whereas before, if you were a team that was working together on all facets of the problem, you, know, you could solve that together and address it in however way, however was most appropriate. Um, so those are the, the three functions, or the three primary characteristics that in socio-technical systems theory have suggested that teams should be formed around these independent autonomous groups. And so when you see it cited today, that's what the theory is used for, is to say, oh, should be, you know, teams should be autonomous. The tests of it have been few and far between, and primarily qualitative. Um, and ultimately, uh, Guzzo and Shea, for example, acknowledged in their chapter on team structure that when I mean, really they haven't had methodologies to test this, or at least haven't used them in a meaningful way to find out if this is ideal. Okay. So I would expect that um, that you, um, you're you going to expect different things from teams depending upon the nature of the interdependence in terms of the activities. I don't know. Are you going to get to that? Uh, we'll get to that a little bit, okay. yes. Because, because you, you think about independent autonomous teams, well, on, on the one hand, they might be doing a... Um, you know, they might be engaged in activities where there's pooled interdependence, sort of like a golf team, right? You do you do your own task, you pull it together, and then you have some performance, but it's largely based upon the individual performance of individuals on the team. Then there's sequential interdependence, which is I do my thing and then I hand it to you, right? And and and, and so now we have to manage an interface, right? And the way that works, that's going to be different than if it's reciprocal interdependence, where we're designing a complex, an automobile or an aircraft, and we have to iterate back and forth and design stuff and try stuff in order to get it to work. 
So um, I guess any of those could be could potentially could, apply, could right? potentially be autonomous. You could put them together. Although if you're creating something that has to be integrated into a whole, right? There's some interdependence. Then that's also going to influence key performance. So how does that fit into this overall approach? The notion of interdependencies. What's the notion? So. And maybe I could, to, to address that a little bit to get to the counterpoint, in addition to having these, you know, social technical system series that says the team should ideally be autonomous, you know, on the counterpoint, multiple team membership theory would say that there actually are some benefits from having these crossovers between teams. Um, interdependence in as much as you're both responsible for the same task. Um, and the difficulty, and one of the measures we get to may talk to this a little bit more, but the notion is you have one panel of patients with team A and another panel of patients with team B. If you have some individuals that then belong to both teams, to a degree, I mean, they're relying on each other to address these two distinct problems, um, where otherwise they'd be completely separate in accomplishing that task. And multiple team membership theory would say that having these linkages across teams, you know, this idea that there is some interaction, can be beneficial to systems in that, A, those added time pressures to people, both from switching from one task to the other, um, and also by having, you know, theoretically a larger workload. They push people to move a little bit more towards efficiency, but more than that, it also causes people to, um, well, it provides the conduit, I should say, for transporting these processes from one team to the next. So way to share best practices if the two teams are doing somewhat similar kinds of work. Right, yes. So, yeah, so in, so in this case, I mean, ultimately, and that's the setting in which we find it, right, is that it's similar work and that they're both dealing with patients. The idea is it's a completely different set. Um, and especially with the VA's push to have that feeling of ownership and connection to your team, um, it's, very, it's a distinct setting when you have you know, one team that's isolated that's working with these panel of patients versus what are some people that will be there sometimes and not others because they're split between, their attention is split between a couple of different tasks. So, so that helps at least a little bit with that. Um, so as we're trying to answer this question and find out what is it that makes, um, that makes assistance perform best, we turn to social network analysis, um, which first off helps us get a really good visual image of what is that's going on but then quantitatively allows us to test it and test some of these structures to see how well they relate to performance. Um, so social network analysis, I know there's several of you are probably familiar with it um, as a brief primer for those who aren't. Um, it's the study of relations. We're trying to find out how uh, different actors relate to one another. So for example, here we're looking at you know, a series of individuals and the connections between them. And, and the connections could be anything from friendship. You know, it could be you know, A is friends with B, A is friends with C. It could also be looking at these people work together. It could be looking at they hate each other. You know, what the relationship is can be absolutely anything you would like to, um, whatever relationship you're interested in modeling. Um, but you can look at it between individuals. Um, you can also look at it between teams or any other entity. So it could be teams that are overlapping in their work assignments. You know, they've worked together, so three and four will be connected. And you can see that visually. And the network analysis allows us mathematically to test some of the features of this network to find out you know, what seems to work and what doesn't. And primarily in network analysis, you're looking at a single group of actors. It's either all individuals or all teams. You know, it's, it's all entities that are the same. But social network analysis also allows you to look at mixtures of the two. So in our case, looking at how individuals relate to teams. So the ties between them are ultimately team memberships. So, I mean, you can look through there and see, you know, person A belongs to team one, person B belongs to both teams, and you can see how those structures are distinct. One last thing it allows you to do, uh, visually and computationally, is you can look at attributes um, to find out how these individuals might differ from one another uh, and model that as well. So in this case, um, just as a, a sample, their colors are based on what role they're filling on the team or what role they fill at the VA. Um, so the providers are red, uh, the RN you can see in blue, the LPN, twice as practical nurse in green, and the clerk um, in this orange, orange is peaches color. So visually, that's it there. And so what you would see from the teams we looked at before, um, you know, if you're looking at these independent autonomous teams, that's how you'd expect it to appear in a network diagram. These unconnected bodies that each has, well, ideally, each of the four roles. If we were looking at a more interconnected, coordinated system, you'd start to see these actual linkages between them. See them connected to each other through these co-memberships, team members that belong to multiple teams. All of this, um, to prepare you at least visually, help you, you know, understand the way this uh, next diagram is going to look. So here's a representation of an actual healthcare system within the VA. So a healthcare system, um, you know, verbiage-wise, it consists of generally a primary hospital. So for example, Salt Lake City, the VA hospital there, 
um, would be a larger hospital in the system, and then all of the outreach clinics, so these smaller clinics, ranging from Idaho Falls down to St. George. Every VA facility between there would also belong to the same system. So here you see one system from the Midwest, um, how their teams are structured, and, and by and large, you know, based on this independent autonomous model, they do a pretty good job. I mean, generally they've got, you know, you can see most of these teams have those four components. They're not connected to others. Uh, there's some exceptions, right? And visually you can see, for example, here, we have a team that uh, has two licensed practical nurses, a couple teams down to here that are missing. They don't have one at all. You can start to spot some inefficiencies in the system. You can also see some teams where you have more interconnections than others. Pretty basic system, and, and on the VA's terms, this is probably how they'd want to have them set up. Now, for contrast, um, and, and keep in mind, so the next image as well, these are two neighboring systems geographically. So it's, there's not a real geographic effect. They're touching. They're very closely related. And following the exact same guidelines, the exact same rules with these teams, we have this structure. So I'll give you a second just to look over that and, and try and make sense of what it is they're doing. Uh, and ultimately, it's, it's very distinct how they're organize, organizing the work and how these team members are interacting with others and with patients. Black diamonds teams? They are, yes. Yeah, so the black diamonds are teams, and then each of the different colors represents different roles. And do the black diamonds contain individuals, or like I'm looking at the bottom right there? Okay. Is that just a team of one? It is, yep. So this is an example where on this team there is one healthcare provider and they have no staff working with them. This almost looks like an HR shared services <laughs> model where you've got the business partners, the blue and the red, and then you've got the shared services tactical uh, process work that has to be done. It is. can be done remotely in many cases. Our business company is present. Yeah, so you can see, and, and, and down here, and this is, it's a, to us, when we first saw this, and, and I've gone through and looked at all 141 systems, and, and there's this and that and everything in between, um, the VA, frankly, had no idea how their teams were being structured. Uh, they were surprised, and, and when we show these, these graphs to people, this one specifically, actually, we showed it to the heads of that area of the country, and they said, there's no way that's right. And then we went and you know interviewed people and, and, and showed this around to some of the key people, and they said, oh, yeah, I know who that is, I know who that is, and, and, and they were able to reconstruct and said, yeah, that's that's actually what we're doing. The methodology for creating diagrams was just survey-based, sort of self-report, who do you work with, how do team members know, how do you get it? Yeah, so this is actually based on their actual team assignments. So this is the way that they're structured in their system and the patients that they're assigned to, which the so by rule they're the only patients. Not Correct, yes. In this case, it's archival based on the VA guidance. Um, so down here, I mean, you see the system where the RNs, as opposed to being members of a single team where they see the same patients, you have this pool that's being drawn upon by 16 teams. At a higher level, as you go out, you see some sharing among the clerks as well. This idea that, you know, they're, they'll work with a smaller group, but still be shared across a few teams and a little more flexible. And then generally, the providers and the LPNs usually belong to one team, but at times, I mean, you'll see them shared in a couple of cases. Um, I mean, so you can see, you, know, you can think through the workflow and think, I mean, identical. On the site and how they're working with patients, it's very different than the experience the patients are getting, especially the experience that these workers are having and who they work with. Because I would imagine these nurses don't really have that identifiable task. I and mean, they're seeing what, 16 teams, anywhere up to 16,000 patients or so. Uh, tough to keep track of that and form that bond and relationship. Um, you can also on this, remember a system is multiple facilities. So we have a large hospital, and you can on this one very clearly see where the smaller clinics based on their interdependence. And so here you can see the way they're structuring. You have your providers, and then they're still using that model with, and whichever staff is available, we'll use. They'll all belong to our team. Um, so antithetical from what the VA was trying to accomplish. Um, and so our curious question is, well, what? So what are the features of these systems that we can look at to see what would predict how well the system performs? What kind of care the patients are receiving? Um, so some of the measures we use uh, for network analysis. First off, it's very simple and very intuitive. It's ultimately, what is the average number of team memberships within the system? Um, so in, in network analysis, we call it degree. But it's the idea of how many connections do you have forming to others? And in this case, the connections between people and teams. So you can see pretty clearly, each of these people has a degree of one. Um, over here, the providers are each assigned to one team. Uh, all the shared staff in the middle has a degree of two. And so what we would expect based on socio-technical systems theory is that those systems in which you have an average lower degree, so people are, are typically members of fewer teams, should outperform systems in which members are members of, are, of lots of teams. Uh, the counterpoint of multiple team membership being, 
but you actually want these connections. You want to have people as members of multiple teams so they can A, you know, kind of be forced through pressure to develop these efficient practices, but then B, also be able to spread those practices through other teams, improving the entire system as a whole. A second measure that we look at uh, is, oh, yeah, here. Sorry, let me just ask you a question. Where they've got those four-person teams set up, how do you deal with vacation time or sick time? Do they have a pool of kind of replacements, fill-ins? That, that, how do they deal with that? They do. Yeah, they have staff that will cover it. Um, there's some replacement people who are on call and can come in. Additionally, they'll sometimes borrow people from other team temporarily. But in this case, this is their permanent assignment and actually what's reflected there. So, so yeah, shortage is that they do cover them. Um, this is a little bit different of a structure what we're looking at. It's not just trying to cover those absences okay. per se. So yeah, excellent question. Did you get at all the difference between the official versus the inactive um, structure of that back in the call? It's kind of related to Peter's question. But, uh, over the long run, there might be all kinds of inactive differences. Um, yeah, so at this point, we haven't, but we're very eager to find that out. Um, so one of the future studies we're putting together, um, for those of you may be familiar, um, MIT's come up with what are called sociometric badges, um, or sociometers. The idea is you can give these badges to people, they wear it on their neck, it's about the size of an iPhone, that will measure, you know, as this group has them, measure their interactions, how close they are to each other, it'll measure the rate of speech, it'll measure the tone of speech, it doesn't capture speech content, so the VA has cleared them for approval because we're not violating privacy. Um, it has an accelerometer, so it'll measure their movement, um, and basically it'll track them 24-7 as they're wearing it, and how those actual interactions are. So we haven't yet, um, we've been approved to order 10 of those, they're about $5,000 a piece, um, we did get funding from the VA, though, so once fiscal year 15 hits starting next month, we should have those on the way. And we're very eager to see what we find out, because it's true, right? There's this formal system in how things are supposed to be, but the informal system could be very distinct. I mean, it could be the interactions from day to day. Really, it's just the RN and the LPN talking together, and the provider's not there very often at all. So, so yeah, to answer your question, that's the long form. Short form, not yet, but we're sure hoping to. So the second measure that we're looking at with these systems, um, is the, so we call it between the centrality and network measures. Um, ultimately, it's measuring the number of people that you uniquely bridge. The thought being that, yes, we can look at the number of teams people have, and, that, and that's a measure of kind of distress and whether attention is divided. But in this case, what this clerk is experiencing here, um, being the sole person that's linking these two teams, is distinct from what these individuals here are experiencing, where they're you know, an entire subcomponent of a team that's working in both places. In this case, I mean, yes, their attention is split to a degree, but they're not the only one sharing the burden. I mean, there's others they can work with as well and pass things off to. Whereas here, that clerk is all alone. Um, they're bridging that gap by themselves. And between the centrality, we we'll say that this person has a higher betweenness than these individuals. Um, they're spreading out and diffusing that relationship across the three of them. Um, and so what we predict is, you know, again, this idea of socio-technical systems theory, autonomous teams, we would expect that lower betweenness would associate with better outcomes. Um, but this learning effect as well would say that, well, maybe we want a little bit more between this. We want that stress on individuals where they're being pushed towards more efficiency because their attention is divided a bit more. That's going to lead to better development of processes. And it's also going to allow them to diffuse them across the teams, improving the system as a whole. Sorry to keep coming in. Can you yeah. give us a little more, more logic on why socio-technical systems theory would say lower between this is good? Yeah, so socio-technical systems theory, ultimately, I mean, between this, to a degree, it can't, well, I shouldn't say to a degree because I'm going to talk about degree. Um, to a point, it captures degree, right? This idea of people being split across multiple teams, and having their own unique identical piece of work. The core relationship with socio-technical systems theory is this idea of boundary control. That in these autonomous teams, you want to be able to control the external forces that are imposed upon you and be able to deal with those as a team. Whereas in this case, with that individual, that control is greatly reduced, especially compared to those individuals over there or its own standalone team. Uh, their control over the external demands through these two different teams is greatly reduced. The performance happens at the team level, correct? Yes. So I'm looking at those two groupings you've got up there. I'm not sure that the boundaries are, in some ways you'd say the boundaries on the, the one on the right are more circumspect than the ones on the left. Hmm. So, so on the one on the left, so, so you're saying in as much as these three people are sharing that, that boundary control of all three of them being shared between teams is going to reduce the team's control over its environment? It's almost like, sure. yeah, you've almost got like a two-team system there where this one is it's kind of two separate teams with one person who bridges them. Uh -huh. you know, and, I, and I wonder, and, I, I appreciate that thought, and it's, and it's a good question in that, I mean, here, I guess the logic that we use to follow through it 
is this idea that for these two systems, you know, when there's a conflict between who are we going to have do this, and that clerk becomes a scarce resource. And this is somebody who there's only one of them, they're shared between the two. When they're with one team, they can't be with the other. Over here, while yes, that's true to be with these three individuals, that does offer a lot of backup coverage as well, um, with multiple individuals being able to serve the teams as the needs arise. Um, so yeah, so I, I do agree. I think over here, I mean, th there is a difference in that such a system theory wouldn't say necessarily that this is the best. We do ultimately want less between this, though. I mean, we want to have this, these more isolated teams that are contained and control their environment. Let me just follow that up. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. So, well, I'll just, just follow up here. So basically, the trade-off is if I have an autonomous team, then I have control over all the people all the time. And I have their I have access to them all the time when we need to, to you know to to perform. If I have someone who's shared on the team, I don't have them all the time. So that's that that could lead to a decrease in productivity. At the same time, because they may bring ideas or best practices, that could lead to an increase in productivity. So now we have these sort of competing um, demand you know competing reasons why you know, having someone jointly shared on the team might be better off or worse off. If a person brings a lot of value in terms of what they've learned, we could be better off. If they don't, then we're worse off. Exactly. That's the that's sort of the basic theory. Yeah, and it's ultimately testing these two ideas to find out, you know, in practice, which one really works. You know, especially in this healthcare setting, you know, which one is optimal for their system. Does that does, does, does that, that help your question, that? Peter? Or is well, there... I guess I'm just thinking if, if you had maybe the, the second system map that you showed us, the average between this is going to be a lot lower than it is over here, and yet there's a lot more. Socio-technical system theory would suggest that being more autonomous is better. That looks like a lot less autonomy than the first one. But I bet a, I bet between this is higher here. Uh, between this will be huge here, yes. And that, I mean, suddenly you have this stress on the system where when you have these common resources that are shared and that are available, um, but the amount of control that each team has over its resources, especially as you look up to these higher levels that are being shared. Um, or, I mean, the idea you have 16 RNs that their attention is being pulled 16 different ways. The availability of those resources for the team are stretched. Um, and so ultimately, I mean, again, they have a great connection between a whole lot of different teams where you can get a lot of best practices disseminated amongst them. Um, but the availability, availability of a nurse at a given time is greatly reduced. So they have a little bit less control over that aspect. Of it. But isn't your hypothesis saying that from, the, from a socio-technical system perspective, this is better than the previous one? No, the opposite. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, mis, I yeah, mis, misread course. that. No, yeah, that's so my fault. Saying, yeah, okay. so the system would say, we want these self-contained teams. We don't want these linkages. Okay. Um, the linkages would be multiple team membership theory that says that, well, these linkages might actually be beneficial and help us. Right? Okay, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. No, I apologize for not being clear sooner, so that's great. Jeff? So each of these roles is very different. You know, the provider, the LPN, the R, and the clerk. Does the role matter in terms of bridging and, and which role is the bridge? So a clerk this is versus an RN, would, would, would that matter in terms of whether the bridging is effective or not? Yeah, excellent question. And the answer is yes. Um, so it's something where it's not presented in the data I have today. We kept it at a more general level. Um, in the research of the VA, and what we're considering adding the publication, we're kind of debating whether to include the role aspect. Um, but yes, who it is who's split between teams makes a very large difference. Um, particularly if it's the RN who's shared you have the most negative impacts. There's somebody you want their attention where it needs to be, which is sad because they're often well, they're the most often person shared as well across all the systems. So yeah, excellent point. The role does definitely matter. My other question is just performance. What have, what's performance look like in this context, and what's the, the outcome that you're calling performance? Yeah, excellent question. Healthcare outcomes are complex and difficult because if you're looking at just the actual outcomes for the patients. There are so many other forces beyond what's just within the control of that staff that affects that, the individual's choices, you know, how well they follow instructions. So the VA is done, and actually healthcare systems across the country, they focus on three pillars. Um, I'll talk more about the specific variables a little later, but at least to get to the pillar idea. Um, access, continuity, and coordination uh, are the three magic words in healthcare. Access being, are people receiving timely care? Do they have access to see their, their um, doctor when they need it? Um, continuity, are they seeing the same people? You know, do they actually, or are they being split across different doctors? Which, even within each of these systems, happens sometimes, just based on needs. Um, and then coordination, the idea that, so this is all primary care teams, and there's other portions of a the hospital. Um, there's emergency care, there's specialty care. 
coordination would say that the better that these primary care teams coordinate with those other areas of the hospital, and also the better they follow up and coordinate with patients when they've had that care, um, the, those three pillars have been linked to these health outcomes very well. And from a performance management standpoint, that's what they want to be looking at in their system because it's within the control of the doctors, within the control of the nurses, um, the actual actions they can take, which will influence the outcomes without putting performance beyond their reach. Um, so yeah, the DVA is split across, across these three pillars. There's some variables that the VA is focused on um, that they give feedback to their staff to. We, we opted to use those because it's what's consciously in their mind and what they're focused on. So, so is there any? Sorry, and then we'll, sorry, we'll go to David if that's okay. I think we need to be quiet so you can get through this. Because I'm like, <laughs> okay, you're figuring out how much continuity <laughs> there is, and then you're measuring it against an outcome of continuity. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> yeah, just a multicollinearity here. So it'll be fun to hear what you have. There. Yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the big finish of the yeah, just So obviously, this is structural. We're looking at just these interdependencies, how people are assigned. And the DVs get to continuity. So let's look at there. And David, you had a question as well. My question based on. She suggests not to talk about it. Sounds good. <laughs> I'm going to suspend it. Okay. In honor of what Chris <laughs> All right. Julie, no, no, it's okay. We'll, we'll make sure we get to it. I'd love to hear the question. And this, so it's a paper that's in progress when we're getting ready to submit. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. I'd, I'd love to hear your ideas on what might be improved, what might be added, and general thoughts on the project because we obviously want to get it published. That's, that's a big goal of ours. Um, so between the centrality, the, the last portion, and again, Social technical systems theory says that you want to form these individual teams around the technically necessary components. Okay, I mean, the basic idea is you want to have everybody there who's supposed to be there. If you don't need somebody there, it's better to omit them. Um, you know, if they're, if they're obsolete, if they're duplicate to the work, you don't want to have them in the team because it makes it more complex. So we use the Blau Index to measure diversity, which ultimately captures this notion of balance within a team. Um, a lot of this is based on the VA's theory of what are those necessary components. We're relying on, relying on them to a degree in this um, aspect. But they've decided to determine with these four roles that's most important. And so as you lose roles, if you have shortages, your blind index score goes down. If you're incomplete, you don't have all of the categories represented. Additionally, as you have over-representation of some of the categories, so if we think back to this shared group where you have two people, two LPNs shared across the same team, that would also cause the blau score to decrease because you have an imbalance in what's present in the team. Um, an extreme imbalance like this, where you have three different people who are duplicated in their role, you have an even lower score. Um, so ultimately, yes, just like, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. an RN can do everything in LPN plus more. So to have a half the index, and it seems like they can do basic clerk duties as well. So it seems rather unfair to make it so small. When, and I do this to everybody. This no, is you're fine. This is, no, this is, this is great. It's true. And I think at the team level, so I you're absolutely right. Into this. Yeah, so at the team level, you're absolutely right. I think, I mean, having three RNs, you have a more capable team, right? When you expand that to the system level, having an RN in this team means you don't have an RN elsewhere. Likely, at least. I mean, the VA, we're talking about a budget constraint here that they have, where, I mean, they have, they're looking at this ideal members of staff. And so, I mean, as we've seen before, ultimately, at least what we've observed happening is that as you do have extra people on some teams, there are other teams in the system that don't have them. Um, and so that's where, the, where we've drawn from it. It's, it's not perfect in that sense, because you're right. I think if all they had were primary care providers and RNs, that would work. But based on the VA's notion of what are these technically required and optimal requirements, that's where the imbalance arises. So from a system perspective, they would see it that way. So I'll be glad to hear your feedback on that. So, um, so the Blau index is the last thing we looked at again, thinking that as higher Blau scores arise, so the higher your Blau score, the more likely you are to, to outperform facilities that have lower Blau scores. Um, this, this balance within the teams. Um, so sample characteristics, what we were looking at, uh, VA healthcare system nationwide, again, only primary care providers, so this is excluding um, specialty care, this is excluding emergency care. Uh, we have 864 different facilities, um, who these networks have been presented. And remember, facilities, it's lower than the, you know, the system level where you have Salt Lake and all the smaller clinics. This is looking across all the facilities, um, each of which has an average of 18 and a half staff members uh, for about, just about 16,000 total. Roughly five teams average per, facil per facility, each of which is caring for a little under 5,000 patients. Um, so that's who we're working with on each of these different networks. Uh, performance metrics, to give a bit more to Jeff. So we've, we've talked about those three pillars of access, continuity, and coordination. Um, the variables that the VA has their people focused on and that they have related to these health outcomes, um, for access, the percent of telephone encounters. Um, the notion that they want their hospital staff, even when people aren't coming in for care, 
making calls to see how they're doing, following up on prior care, um, and offering health tips as well. They want to see more of these, um, these telephone encounters happening. They're more efficient, and they found they're also incredibly effective for helping people. So that's the percentage of patients who are receiving telephone encounters? So the percentage of their total encounters that are telephone-based. So if you think of all the encounters that a team will have across a month, you know, what percentage of those were via telephone? And, and they want that number to be higher because that means they're contacting more patients. A phone call is a lot quicker than a phone visit. Okay. Are they made or human? The phone, phone calls? Human. So that's, yeah, these are phone calls made by those members of the team um, that are counted in there. Uh, we also have the percent of patients that are seen within one day of the desired date. So are they getting in when they want to be getting in? And are they being seen? Uh, under continuity, we have the percent of encounters that are with their primary care provider. So again, this idea of are they seeing their same staff over and over again, or are they seeing somebody different when they come in? Maybe one staff is busy and passes them to someone else. Uh, for health outcomes, that's not optimal. You want to have that continuous relationship. Uh, and then finally, on coordination, and if I had to pick a favorite variable, it would come in right here on the ER urgent care utilization rate, which is the idea of how often are the patients within a, within a panel having to visit the ER or urgent care. Um, the thought that, you know, as they're, if they're having coordination, they shouldn't be having to go there. There should be a little more proactivity. So just have the measure, you know, the, the downside and the dark side of what's happening. Um, and last is two-day post-discharge discharge contact, which ultimately measures when patients go in and they're seen by, say, a specialist or somebody else in the system, is the primary care team, who didn't see them on that visit, following up within a couple of days, um, having follow-up contact to see how they're doing, um, follow-up to find out what happened. Um, having that continuous communication between the team and the patients, again, is also associated with great health outcomes. How's that not access? Uh, on the post-discharge. So access, um, the reason it's not is because access is focused on are they able to get in touch with their primary care team. In this case, it's contact that coordinates visits with other people, with specialty care, with emergency care. Um, so that's why they, they link that in coordination because it's actually a cross-system rather than within that primary care system. Is there any effort to balance sort of the severity of the health issues that the patients are dealing with across these panels? I, I feel like I set that up. This is great. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, so our control variables, what we've controlled for, and, and you help me, and hopefully I can explain it. If not, please let me know. Um, so controls to make sure that we're looking at things even-handedly. Uh, the number of patients within a uh, system, also patient complexity. Um, so they have a measure they call the Diagnostic Cost Grouping Average, uh, DCG Average for short, which is math that I would never want to do in my wildest dreams. Ultimately, what it boils down to is looking at um, each individual diagnosis of each patient, all their past health issues, um, any risks or concerns, demographic information, calculates a number for each patient, aggregates that across an entire system and says, based on the average expected cost and severity compared to the normal Medicare patients, how do they rank? Do you have it at the team level? Um, yeah, so, so the patient complexity, it's a, we have it at the team level and also at the system level. Okay. So for each team and system, they've got that average or that, that calculation of, as a whole, how complex are the patients seen by this entity? Okay. So, yeah, and it's, it's again, wild calculations more, but it's, it's actually a wonderful measure. It's something that a lot of people spend a lot of time developing. Again, to be able to measure effectively across the system, taking into account who they're seeing. Um, we also control for the number of hours worked by a provider and the number of hours worked by staff. Um, so, you know, part-time providers, you expect a little difference. A lot of that shows up in the number of patients, but not exclusively. Um, so we control for that additionally. And then also the number of team members. So just, you know, obviously if you have more team members, you have more health present. We want to control for that so we can get at instead these connections and this, this network structure of these facilities. Um, the way we measure this, so we use beta regression. Um, the idea and why it was so appropriate for our, our uh, data is a generalized linear model that allows us to work with non-normal data distributions. And the primary benefit of it was because um, beta regression when using the Loja Bank allows you to model the continuous distribution from zero to one as opposed to normal logistic regression where it's a zero one binary outcome and you're calculating odds ratios. Um, instead, it actually can capture that, you know, without making predictions beyond the boundary interval, allow us to look at rates. Um, so because the outcomes are often rates, percent of calls made, uh, percent of patients seen within a certain date or a certain time, um, beta regression helped us to model that effectively. Uh, and we did it all in R. Um, so R has become my new best friends and they have worked a lot with. Um, at the VA, it's actually all that was available to us. Um, it's complex and it takes some getting people to know, but uh, it's been very robust and, and Ian and I were able to write a, a great script to pull in the data and also analyze it. Um, so results. 
talk a little about what we found. And, and the, the green results, this would say it's supporting the idea of socio-technical systems theory, that you want these more self-contained, independent, and autonomous teams. Um, so we'll take it by we'll take it by a variable, just to talk about that a little bit, probably the easier way. Um, so access, for example, as you do have more balanced coverage in your roles, um, so as you have those, you know, more towards those four members and not people missing and not duplicate roles, um, you're make, more likely to be making telephone encounters. Um, you've got all your components there, and those telephone encounters are possible. Um, now, in between this, you're probably looking at the zero coefficients and thinking, wait a minute, you know, it's, it's a, the reason it's zero is because of scaling. Um, scaling of the variable in between this ranged from, oh, I think, you know, zero to one was the lowest, up to about 900. Um, so because of that, or because we're producing this bounded confidence interval, or this bounded interval, um, you know, the zero coefficient, it's significant, and I'll, I'll show you some effect sizes to give you a hint of what, what it's affecting, but um, ultimately the, the relationships are there, it just doesn't show through very well with two decimal places. Um, so between this was a surprise for us on access uh, for telephone encounters, showing that as you have people split between more teams and they're more often that unique link, they're actually more likely to be making phone calls. Um, so not what we would be expecting. Um, we would, ex you know, multiple team membership theory would say splitting their attention is moving them towards more efficient practices. So we suspect because making telephone calls is quicker and easier way to have contact with patients, I mean, perhaps the re their attention being split more uniquely across teams is actually leading them to be making more telephone calls. Um, we can't determine the causation necessarily, but that's what we suspect. Um, degree did not have effect there for access uh, on the percent being seen within one day of the desired date. Although between this helps people make telephone encounters, when you have higher between this within a system, it actually decreases the likelihood that you'll see them in a timely manner. Um, so again, that splitting of attention is affecting whether the, the panel can get to their patients within one day of when they want to come in. Uh, on continuity, now we didn't find any results here couple reasons why we suspect that is. One, you know, the VA does a lot of things well, a lot of things poorly, um, but one of the things they do really well is they are pretty good about making sure you're seeing your same doctor. Uh, there wasn't quite as much variance in this variable to be explained in the first place, but additionally, um, the fact that the variable only captures if they're meeting with their provider and doesn't actually capture if they're meeting with their nurse or with their licensed practical nurse. Um, the VA has recognized the fault in that. They're actually in the process right now of rolling out a refined measure that'll capture encounters with any team member. So we're excited to see if these results will change when we use that new variable, um, because it's not always their doctor they'll have contact with. Sometimes a visit, you'll just meet with your nurses and be taken care of them fine. Um, they tried rolling it out a couple of months ago. It, they had a lot of glitches, it didn't work, so they pulled in, and hopefully we'll have it soon, and we can compare that with the latest updated network data. Uh, yeah? Wasn't it the average of 18 people, uh, the providers, nurses, uh, per unit? Did I see that right? Yes, per facility. It's a very small facility anyway, which makes continuity likely. Right. Um, it's hard to note down. Yeah, and, 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 and even in the larger systems where, you know, there are, you know, I'll tell you, you know, hundreds of people that work there, generally they still do a pretty good job. I mean, that's one of the strengths of the VA is they have structure that's put together where you're often getting in. Um, and so last but not least on coordination, this idea of following up other parts of the system, um, degree had a, uh, an effect for the ER urgent care utilization ratio. So as members in a system become members of more and more teams, their patients are more likely to have to use ER or urgent care. Uh, more likely to use this more expensive and less efficient care style. Um, and also, the, as you have that um, better balance between the roles on teams from what, it's, from what the ideal is, the greater the balance, um, the less often they're having to see uh, ER or urgent care. So the balance is actually a helpful feature. Then we also have, so on the two-day post-discharge ratio, um, so a degree, same thing, is you're on more teams, you're less likely to be making these calls. Yeah. So is it possible that the fact that these patients maybe have phys physical needs that send them to the ER or urgent care, that they're then reaching out for ideas, or they're, that's part of what, I'm just questioning the direction of causality here. Yeah, part of that. So, so, so what you're saying is because the people are going to the ER, that would influence network structure? That, that might influence my, I, I might reach out, if, if someone's having problems, you know, that I'm more likely to perhaps maybe reach out to others in the hospital to get, you know, input or ideas or, and I don't know exactly yeah, how these teams work, so if, if, if this is completely off base, then just say, no, people don't do that. No, we, we, it's, it's a good thought and a good idea, and, and ultimately, I think that's something we would like to capture, um, as we talked about earlier, about this informal network, right, and the actual interactions. 
Whereas in this case, we're looking at the actual the formal assignments and where they are. So this is only the formal assignment. Exactly, yes. Right. This is the formal network. I think the informal network would prove very informative there to see, A, are they reaching out? B, who are they reaching out to? Um, there's some unique effects that we can look at there. And hopefully we'll have the chance to do so. What's your R squared for the regression? Oh, um, so pseudo R squared. Let me pull up that slide. Did I lose it? Because it seems like betweenness is irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter that it's significant. It has no impact. Well, the, the coefficients are small, but in some of like the rate is large, they can still, they can still have a, a big impact. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's ultimately on the scale of the of betweenness, as it were. Um, I think we keep down the significance because it's a bit of a So if the R squared, so it varies by variable. Um, but as you find, as you enter the network measures, in some cases, for example, telephone encounters, um, the pseudo R squared, you know, roughly doubles. Not quite, but almost. So you're explaining about 10% of your variance. Mm -hmm. Yep, 10 is okay. the 17% when we introduce the network measures. Okay. Um, within desired date, uh, 0 0.016 to 0.032, so not a lot of that variance. Um, continuity, again, I mean, you don't see a whole lot of extra variance that's explained by the control variables, not within network measures. Uh, and then, so ER urgent care, we're explaining about 40% of the variance, um, and about 7% on two-day post-discharge contact. So. I redesigned your model. We can talk about it after. Oh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Use the others. <laughs> okay. Excellent. And, then, and so also with, let's see, where were we? I think we've looked through all these at this point. Is there any other myths you'd like to hear about? Um, let me share with you some of the effect sizes then on what we found. Um, so the way, in healthcare, this is not the optimal system for me, but the way they like to divide out to find out what the effect is is looking at deciles. The top decile versus the bottom, they break it out that way. Also, you can see what some of the effects are. Uh, for example, ER urgent care utilization. Um, with degree, the top 10%, you know, 25% of their patients are utilizing those on an annual basis. Bottom 10%, you know, 27%. It seems like a fairly small measure, a small difference, until you expand that to about 6 million patients. Um, suddenly, you know, it starts to make a little bit more of a significant effect, and you can drop that by a couple of percentage points. That has great practical impact on the system. Uh, reduces a lot of the burden upon them. Um, just look down as well, so ER urgent care, again, my favorite variable of the bunch. Uh, so with the Blau Index, because you have that roll coverage and it's balanced coverage, there's a 5% difference uh, from 25% to 35% based from the top to bottom. So you're looking at roughly a one-sixth decline in the number of patients that are coming in to use the ER or urgent care um, because you've got balanced teams, or that are associated with that, that notion of balanced teams. Um, on that variable, that's one that the VA has been asking about and curious about. Uh, Ian and I have run some calculations just to get a rough practical effect of what that would look like in dollar amounts. Um, based on the VA's methodology, uh, there were a one standard deviation improvement in this role coverage um, would lead to about $30 million in savings for the VA, which Given how large the system is, may seem like chump change, but it's it's actually a you know, fairly large amount of money that, that they can make a difference with. And then we also have um, this benefit of inter interdependence and this idea that as people are spread across more teams in that unique link, um, telephone encounters are increasing, you know, six percent based on the percentage of words that uh, of the total encounters that they're making. Um, so ultimate conclusions from this. Um, Based on, all the, on the variety of variables, as teams from the medical system stray from these self-contained autonomous teams, they generally perform worse. Um, not exclusively, but generally across the system, they aren't doing as good of a job of meeting those three pillars of access, continuity, and coordination. There are, however, some advantages. Um, and so it does seem like it may be pushing people a bit more to this, um, to efficiency and making these phone calls. Um, so what we're looking at from here on out, well, practical implications. So, Right now, the VA has received um, about $16.3 billion for an overhaul. They're looking for plugging in staff, and we've been fortunate to be a part of helping identify where those holes are and where staff might be needed, and also which staff might be needed. Uh, so from a practical standpoint, it's been a great project to help make an impact. Um, limitations, of course, we are looking at a single government-run entity, and this is, yes, it's a lot of facilities. Ultimately, it is one system, though. Um, and so, you know, take that for the grain of salt, you know, whether it extends to others. The nice thing is that this does back up the findings from earlier as people were trying it in smaller settings, um, at qualitative research looking at primarily blue collar manufacturing settings. Um, it works in white collar, more complex settings as well, uh, based on the findings that we have. 
Um, we talked a bit about this idea of you know, what's the informal structure, what's the actual interactions uh, versus formal structure. But also, one thing we're really curious about and starting to work on right now is that, and this is all kept up, all based on one month's data. So one month of where people were assigned and one month of performance outcomes and where they were. We're curious to see, um, we just took a look, so this is from data from September of last year. I just took a look a couple days before I came out here at what it looks like now. There's been some pretty dramatic changes, in some cases for the better and in other cases for the worse. And so we're really curious to see as these networks shift over time, um, does that also cause different impacts as people move away from one or move towards another? Um, so we're curious to find out about that and see what happens in the long term. Um, so future research, obviously, you know, network changes over time. A couple of research interests of mine that tie into this idea of, of team, joining a team and becoming a part of it. You know, does it make a difference whether the team members have a say in who joins? This notion of voice. If you have, you know, in the selection process, often it's HR that's doing the hiring, they join your team and you meet them. You know, what's the effect of having the team members take a part in that selection and actually choose who it is who's going to join their team? Does that cause an increase in psychological ownership? Does that cause that, you know, maybe to their detriment in some cases? How does that affect the team joining together? Uh, also, as team members are leaving, you know, this idea of change across the network over time, as people exit that network, what are they leaving behind? Are they leaving behind you know, what their remaining team members? Is it just affect? You miss the person? You know, are you just used to working in a certain way with them, and so you have this kind of cognitive um, way of doing the task that's left with you? You're know, looking at some of those different dimensions of you know, what's the hole left, and as, as Jeff and I were talking earlier, you know, what are the shoes to fill? You know, what's left in that team as far as an imprint? Um, so that's that project uh, as far as team network measures. Um, with the time remaining, we've got oh, about 20, 25 minutes. I'd like to give you just a vision of where my dissertation's at, um, what it is I'm looking at, and, and the data that I got collected for that. Um, so the high-level questions I'm curious about, and it, it ar arises somewhat from the work I've done in the VA. Um, we're using the VA sample as well. Um, but this idea of you know, membership change, uh, when you have people exiting and other people replacing them, the general finding in the literature is that as people are leaving, it disrupts team function. Um, look at a resource-based view that somebody leaves who has a certain skill set, Somebody arrives with a new skill set, that skill set might be greater. However, there's some specific knowledge about the team, how it interacts, how it functions. It departs with the departing member and does not yet exist in the person arriving. So the general literature will say that it's disrupted the teams. There's some occasions where, depending on your, your DD and what you're looking at, it can lead to increases in creativity. Um, people who are incoming to teams can cause the team to reevaluate where things are, make some improvements. Um, but People haven't looked at a whole lot at what is it that makes this membership change either more disruptive or less disruptive uh, based on the characteristics of the changes. Uh, but also, what's the, to me, what's the missing part of the story, all of these turnover studies which typically look at separation rates or instability rates, ultimately the idea is you look at a year of data of who was there. Say, so, oh, we had these people at the beginning, this many of them stayed to the end, therefore this is our turnover rate, what's performance now? And a lot of it's based on these stable time points um, and, and what's performance at a single point. What's overlooked and hasn't been evaluated is this notion of what about adaptation afterwards? You know, this disruption is suffering. You know, somebody leaves, they leave a whole performance, you know, perhaps drops for a time. What might influence whether teams bounce back from that quicker or more slowly or whether they bounce back at all? Uh, so my dissertation is geared towards answering these questions. Um, visually, also we're modeling it using uh, discontinuous growth modeling. And so the idea is you know, we can model both what their trajectory was prior to the change. Um, the time period we selected for my study is six months. So we follow a team you know, for six months looking at their performance and how they did. They then experience some level of membership change. Um, in some cases, it's a single member leading. In other cases, it's multiple members. So there's some level of disruption that occurs. And then so we follow for the next six months seeing, first, what's the performance difference? You know, what is the actual change uh, caused to occur in the next month? But then also, the trajectory following. How does the team rebound from that and get back on its feet, or, or does it at all? Um, and so the two theories um, that we're grounding this in, first, so collective membership change theory. There have been a couple of great pieces just in the last year or so uh, by House Connect and Holbert and Nyberg and Ployhart that, that bring up this idea that really people look a lot at the quantity of turnover, how many people are leaving. There's not really a lot of work that looks at who's leaving. Or more importantly, you know, at least to me, it's not just you know, who's leaving that's affecting how the team performs, but ultimately, those members who remain within the team are the ones who deal with the consequences of turnover. They're the ones who, after the person departs, they're making up for the work of the new person as they adjust, they're integrating with the team, 
this workload is ultimately placed on, on those people as well. Uh, and so looking at the characteristics of them and how well they're able to interact and coordinate together. Um, and so the, the three highlights that come out of the literature is, I mean, yeah, we have some mixed effects of, of membership change. And so they recommend that people look at the quantity and the quality and then also the context. So where it occurs, or in this case in the literature, is that the same quantity of turnover can have vastly different effects. Um, you know, if you're losing, think of a healthcare team, for example, if you lose your provider, it's going to be a lot different effects on the team than if you're losing your clerk and replacing them. Now, there's different components of the work that, that may differ based on the outcome, but ultimately, just the number of people doesn't quite capture it. And the letters still bring that in the literature. Um, now, what I wanted to link this with is team adaptation theory. The notion that teams, what causes them to change, to make adjustments and make improvements, rests upon the ability to notice a cue. Um, some kind of disruption, some kind of note that lets them know changes needed will be beneficial to the team. Um, without noting that cue, without encountering it, without recognizing it, that change doesn't occur. Um, the team just continues onward. Um, there's some great literature. There's a, there's a study by Lewis et al. Um, and part of what motivated me to do this study and what, what really got me interested in it where they looked at uh, membership change, and they, they got the idea of how many people are changing within student work teams, and found that when you change just one student, so one team member leaves, another one comes in, the remaining team members tended to keep working in the exact same manner. They assumed that the person coming in filled the exact same role, had the same knowledge, and ultimately used to their detriment. Um, those teams performed worse because they weren't able to adapt with that small change. Whereas when other teams experienced larger numbers of change, two or three or four of the, well, two or three of the team members, as that occurred, teams were willing to let go of the old way of doing things, let go of their cognitive structures, let go of their transactional memory systems, and engage anew and work together as a team. And so those teams that actually had more disruption at those moments by losing more members, actually outperformed the teams that only lost one member. Um, and so it, it was a, it's a wonderful study, but it left me wanting at the end thinking, okay, so we have this one time point, those who experienced small change, so they, you know, they didn't perform as well, but let me want to so what happens next? You know, what's the rest of the story? If they struggle at this point, are they going to catch on eventually? Are they going to be oblivious to it? You know, are these other teams just going to keep advancing and performing better? That's a question we don't really have the answer to yet, but I'd like to answer with my dissertation. Um, and so as, as teams catch on to this, yeah, Peter. Um, you, you mentioned transactive memory systems, so I'm curious. Have you thought about that? Are you connecting your theory with, I'm trying to think through the, the logic here, but transactive memory systems would normally predict that losing members is bad, and losing more members should be worse than losing fewer members. Are, are you tying that into your theorizing at all? A bit, yeah, and the idea comes down to, so, so there's these competing ideas. One is that, well, if you disrupt the transactive memory system more, it's gonna hurt the team, right? But from a learning perspective, if we're thinking of trajectory, you know, once it's disrupted, if it's a small disruption, the odds of the team responding to that by adjusting the new member coming in, making adjustments to the transactional memory system based on that person's characteristics, their knowledge, and the new, whatever they bring to the group, as that happens, they're actually less likely to adapt. And so while they may see less of a performance decrease initially, you also, you know, they may not see as much of an improvement later on either. Um, so it's this idea of first, I mean, the initial disruption, I think you're absolutely right. You know, as you disrupt that transactive memory system more, you're going to see less of it. Well, sorry, as you disrupt it less, you'll see less of their initial disruption. You also see less learning effects and less adaptation over time. That's what I would predict. Um, so ultimately, once the, again, this should vary depending upon the task, right? Yes. In the context, this, if you're working on things where that sort of memory is important, a lot of reciprocal interdependency, if you lose someone, that's a problem. When you're working on new tasks and maybe you want diversity of ideas and then maybe it's okay to have some turnover because you're trying to create something brand new and you want. So I, I could imagine that, it, that this could predicted outcome could change depending upon the nature of the task. Yeah, and I agree. And I think that's what the membership change literature would say as well, is that especially when you have learning outcomes, and that's one of the great benefits of membership change, bringing in a new perspective, um, somebody who has fresh ideas and is able to share those um, with a learning type of task, membership change can be very beneficial. And literature bears that out. Uh, when it comes to performance of a task that requires this inner coordination between people, and it's not so learning-based, probably the opposite direction. Um, it's a little more disruptive than it is beneficial to bring those new individuals in. Um, and that's through that loss of team-specific capital that, that disappears from the team. Uh, so ultimately, the three different types of change that I'm looking at, um, let's see, uh, okay, so 
three types of change. We'll leave it here for now. One is, so the quantity is recommended. So how many people, how many members have changed in that discrete time? Um, two is, what's the status of those who have changed? Um, the thought being that as members who are higher in status change, um, you know, you change your provider or you change your RN, that's more disruptive to the team, especially as the newcomer is getting up to speed. Um, that initial effect of them you know, trying to learn how the team operates, you'll see that you know, it's tougher for them. However, as you look at trajectory over time, um, how the team improves, new members do arrive to teams with new ideas, with a fresh perspective. Um, the question is, will they be heard? Uh, and while there's many forms of power that people can have that might influence whether or not their perspective is listened to and brought in by the team, or at least seriously considered, a lot of those forms of power are based around things like knowledge of the person's skills, or these interpersonal connections and relationships that can grant, you know, somebody can gain power by having that confidence with someone. One of the... Status versus function, why, why not function, why status? Uh, so the status is chosen primarily because primary care teams and, and medical teams are incredibly hierarchical. Um, it's, it's pervasive in a lot of the literature. I mean, it's based on this idea that the doctor says what to do, everyone else does it. And if you're lower than the RN, whatever the RN says go. Uh, and so while, while yeah, I mean, function can be looked at as well, I think because of the nature of the sample, because we do have this built-in natural hierarchy, um, status becomes appropriate in that sense because, and the literature read out with the medical literature and, and also all the work that's been done on medical teams, that that really is the case. I mean, somebody can have a high status but, but just give a lot of the decision-making and a lot of the, a lot of the functional responsibility to other people to distribute it. So I'm just basing that on what I've seen in terms of doctor nurse interaction and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah what, it's a good thought, and, and not to stray too far from it, but another project that we're finishing up right now is looking at this notion of delegation. Um, and what we what we found, and again, we can talk more about the specifics later, is ultimately the greater the status difference you have, uh, for example, the provider versus a licensed practitioner nurse who, I mean, again, they're trained, they can be a provider, don't have as extensive training, you know, oftentimes they were formerly an RN, the greater the status difference in the medical teams, the less likely they are to delegate. Um, they actually have a hard time with that in the system. That's that's caused some serious issues with the VA. But, uh, but yeah, I appreciate that. Part. Are, are you intending to control uh, among the system? I'm, I'm assuming the basis here is still the VA staff. So are you, for example, if you if you have a if you have a less experienced RN leaving and a charge nurse coming in, you would seem to have different uh, a different effect on the team, no matter who's on the team. Right. So is that, is that part of the analysis then? Is yeah, controlling through their, their position, their qualifications. Right, within, within, within their status. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about status, but status in, in their level would be different as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so within, so is this a, an RN showing up with lots of experience, or is an RN show with less experience? Yes. So that's, and we don't have all the variables we want quite yet. We're waiting in the VA for a couple more. We can do the analysis without them, um, but we do have, you know, the amount of time, at least within the VA system they've worked. Um, and so, yeah, we can compare this, this idea of tenure to a degree on how long they've been there. But excellent question. Are you also controlling for their previous team performance? So maybe, maybe especially for providers, if, if they came from a great, that team was performing well, you'd expect the next team to perform well as well. Yes, yep, and we're controlling for prior team performance as well. In as much as people come from a prior team, that is. And that's, and that's the trick, because some people do a right move, so. Uh, but yeah, that's something we did consider. What about the reason for, for so if somebody is leaving because they're getting fired um, versus they're leaving because they're getting promoted because they were so wonderful, those kinds of disruptions should impact um, the effect on the team as well as performance. If you're losing your best player versus you're losing the dead wood. The person that everybody hated. Yeah, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So is that something that you're looking at? At this point, we've been unable to get that data. We're hopeful to. Um, it's, yeah, the bureaucracy is a little thick to cut through, but that's the thing we would like to model if we could. Because I agree, I think it would make a difference where if you're losing somebody that the team doesn't like, that perception from the new person is going to be very, very different versus if you're losing the beloved doctor that you've worked with for five years and now you're transitioning to somebody new. Yeah, so. so, yes, I would love to be able to include that. But can you at least see where they're going? Like, if, 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 if uh, they're moving within the VA system, external. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could at least see, yeah, if they're moving external to the VA versus internal. Yeah, so I think something else that we can we can control for model, because we do know, while we don't have all the data on all of their experience everywhere else, we do know how long they've been to the VA, and so we can tell when they're arriving to this team, are they transferring internally or external? So I think that's a control that we'll want to include. But I mean the person that's leaving. If, yeah. if they're getting fired, they're not going to be there anymore. 
in your sample. Voluntary right. versus involuntary turnover seems like we could even get that without whether they were well liked by the team is a different a different story. But yeah, well liked I don't feel they get to whether it. whether it was uh, a termination not by their choosing or they voluntarily decided to go somewhere else to a different opportunity. That's I would a good think process. we could get that somehow. And I should try to give them more variance. No, I think it's a good idea. It's something we've looked for and asked for before and weren't able to track down. Um, but I agree, I think it's time to redouble our efforts on that because I think you're right, there's a very drastically different effect whether it's a voluntary versus an involuntary quiz. So while it's, it's not a perfect proxy for what we would expect for how it is with the team, I think that's at least an effort and attempt. So it's a great thought. Thank you. Um, so with it, so with our study, um, yeah, I mentioned we're using discontinuous growth model. Well, it's my study, it's my dissertation. Um, discontinuous growth modeling, um, as used by Lang and Blisi, um, looks at these time. Again, we have a one-year time period for these teams. Sample-wise, uh, right now we're at 286 teams. Um, it's counting. Uh, we have more coming in as well. Ultimately, we're still looking just at primary care teams. Uh, and to restrict, you know, as we know there's some network effects with multiple team memberships that, if you're looking at just the team level, may not be captured. Uh, in order to make sure we have a tight controlled uh, study, I'm limiting the teams to that only those that have the four core roles put present. So these are teams that are identically structured. They have, it's not missing pieces that's causing them to have difficulties or, or react differently. Um, and also on team structure, these are teams that are self-contained. Um, so we don't have that multiple role difference, which again, we would expect you know, somebody who's in that linking role leaves and somebody else joins, it may be a different effect. And, and at this point, we aren't ready to model that, although I'd like to look at it in the future. Um, so we control that fairly tightly on who we're using. Uh, and right now, so we have, you know, 133 instances where RNs are the ones who are leading, 121 where it's the LPN, and 181 where it's the clerk. Um, the reason providers aren't up there right now, uh, this is what I'm working on presently, is because all of the data is provider-based, it's linked to them. Um, it's a process in linking, when a provider leaves, having that um, new, the prior performance be linked to who was the provider before, and the subsequent performance be who was the provider afterwards. Um, so that's, you know, those are coming together and we have a, a decent sample that will end up being in the provider slot. Uh, not quite ready yet. Uh, and then on the number of changes, for the most part it's teams that experience one single change event and that's it. Uh, but we do have 73 teams that experience two changes and another 38 that experience three. Uh, again, we also, so this is all data up to January of this year. Um, there's additional data that, that I've gotten been captured that will also be added in the sample as well. Um, as are there any simultaneous changes? or within that six month period, you know, you might lose three people at different times within that yeah. versus three people at once. Right. So in this case, it's simultaneous. Um, I could expand that. I mean, it's, it would be interesting is modeling it with the time difference, right? You know, so if you lose one person one month, one person a couple months later, one person a couple months later, it's fundamentally different, right? right. Um, so in this case, it's looking at just that discrete time point when they leave. Um, but I think there's some interesting questions that could be answered by expanding that and looking at maybe the patterns of departure. You know, maybe you have teams that, if they experience you know, a, a one departure time one, another one, by time three, they're used to this change. Right? You know, they develop some, uh, well, they've insulated themselves to the effects of change, develop some processes that might help them to better manage it, uh, versus whether the change happened all at once. So yes, yeah, so this is the one time and then six months uninterrupted before, six months uninterrupted after. So that's the sample we're working with. It's collected, and I'm excited to find the results, hopefully here soon. Um, project timeline. So my proposal was defended in July. Um, data collection and, and that structuring as well with the providers is still ongoing. Um, look to have that done. I mean, depending with, with schedules over the next month, um, I think by the end of October. Uh, running analyses shortly after that, and then writing the final, final write-up in anticipation for an April defense, which will be exciting to have out of the way and wrapped up. So. As I see the grins of people in the audience, that, that convinces me it's true. Um, <laughs> so that's where we're in the process at this point. Um, any other questions about, about this study or the other study or, or anything else at this point? I'm, I'm fortunate to have you here at this time. I, the door's open. You can leave. And you're not the most captive audience. But I would, I would love to hear hear your thoughts and get some feedback. So let's go. Well, sorry. Just a quick curiosity. I'm just wondering where in the author order you're going to put that in. <laughs> Once the model's there, yeah, we'll see. I mean, she could have her way up a little bit. We'll, we'll see where it's at, so. And no thanks, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen's, Kristen's here, who did not ask questions, but asked some good questions. So, I, I do appreciate it. I look forward to seeing the model be put. So, thank you.
So, what if you had five, ten minutes with the CEO and you know the, all of the leaders of the VA hospital? What, what would you what would you tell them would be the most important thing you've learned that might help them to manage their system more effectively? If you had to probably, if you had to say this is this is this is a really important sort of takeaway from my research. Yeah. Okay. I'll look at the policy implications. Yeah. Be honest. So, uh, I, I, mean, I think, you know, step one and, and the reaction we've got, so we've actually in the last couple of weeks had a few national seminars that VA's had us do talking about some of this work. Um, and I, I think number one would be first to get a hold and understand how people are structured. And I, I think in their mind they see things one way and it's, it's drastically different. And then beyond that to say, I mean, really, in as much as funds, funds will allow, you want to be structuring these I, um, I, these teams that are separated, that are autonomous, that can do their own work, uh, and especially as much as they can be careful where there's your redundancies of people, do your best to not have people assign multiple teams. I mean, that, you know, the fact size is that that was one of the greatest impacts. It's hurting their healthcare system. Um, and so, in essence, it's somewhat encouragement of, of actually following through and doing what they said they were doing, and that's forming these teams that can focus on patients and develop that relationship. Um, and I, I mean, encouraging them to get an idea about what's actually going on and then and make those changes to fall more in line with maybe what they originally anticipated but isn't actually happening. Um, it's a large complex system and, and I understand it's a difficult thing for them to do. Um, a second unrelated thing, I and mean, we talked about this a little bit, uh, given the advice to not set unattainable goals because that leads to unethical behavior, but that's a separate issue. So <laughs> that, that would be my, my aside comment too. Yeah, Peter. I'm curious, when you, as you leave Iowa, uh, what is your access to these data going to look like? Are you going to continue to have access to the database and build it? Uh, so I'm curious to see how that ends up working. So ultimately, the, the contact is only good at Iowa. Um, so Greg Stewart spent about three years developing Goodwill with the VA to get us access in the first place. And so the, the world of credit goes to him for getting us into the organization um, in the first place, because without him, it wouldn't have happened. Um, since then, we've been given a, a six-year, $15 million grant. Um, so they'll be continuing there. There's four research labs across the country that are locations. Um, so Iowa City is one of them. It's these um, you know, VA-based research labs. They're the ones funding it. So as I depart, I'm not anticipating having a lot of continued access. It's possible that I could, especially with the Salt Lake VA so close uh, with other facilities. Um, they allow remote working. I know they've worked it out with some people. I hope to keep that connection to be able to do a little bit more research and keep working with them. Uh, at this point, it's unclear, though, unless I wouldn't be covered by that crash anymore. So we'll see. Kristen. Just a couple of ideas for you as you're moving forward. It's really interesting research. I think you can tell there's a lot of interest in what you're doing. Um, one would be to look at how the role that the person is in and whether or not they leave impacts that team performance. And I'm assuming there will be greater impacts for certain roles, but you don't know it's like, and so kind of look at that mechanism. And the other thing would be, um, what's the actual cause or what's the mechanism that's causing that outcome. So if we're finding small tight teams with these people in these roles tend to perform better, is that because they're off on a satellite office and there's a lot of accountability so if the clerk doesn't do his job everybody knows so he's going to do his job, you know what I mean, versus other mechanisms that are causing that kind of performance out of that team structure. Yeah, and I'd be curious to see, so there's, there's a qualitative component of another study we've done where there's been interviews both with patients and with staff. Um, based on the content of those and what we found out, at least in their minds, what they're saying is making the difference, is this idea that they're able to form relationships with each other. You know, the patients, they've been thrilled and excited saying, you know, wow, I don't just know my doctor, I know my nurse. Um, you know, again, that could be investigated a lot of different ways with measurement to find out if that's really what's going on. Um, but at least perceptually to them, that seems to be the driving force. Um, and also from the team saying, wow, you know, actually, I, I'm forming this, I met with a patient, I met with him again a few weeks later, I knew who it was. They seem to be very drawn to that. So, um, yeah, I'd be curious to look a little bit more at those mechanisms to see if those perceptions are accurate or if there's something else perhaps driving them. Handoffs, so bad. Mm -hmm. That'd be at least some research that Curtis I know would be able to speak to. So, excellent. Yeah, Ashley. So, I, I mean, just thinking um, through this, and I don't know if this is this is correct or not, but when you're talking about three changes. Because the data is tied to the provider, what that means is the provider is getting a new RN, LPN, and clerk. And so maybe that's beneficial. However, what if the RN is getting a new 
provider, LPN, and clerk. Maybe it's not so beneficial, right? Because it's a high status yep. person that's, whether they're initiating the chain or change or not, um, I think that this benefit of, ooh, three changes, um, maybe be t because of um, a, a, fa a factor of the, of the data, yes. this alternative. Yeah, it's almost an interactive effect there too, right? You know, it's yeah. not just the number of changes, but what if it's an interaction between what the number of changes is and who it is who remains, right? Yes. And that's something that, that I actually find the model does three, looking at not just the actual forces and, you know, the quantity of change, the status of the person leaving, and, and the ability to coordinate for those who remain, but also this idea of, you know, what about if you have three, exactly what you said, three people who leave, but what if the person who remains is the provider, but what is the clerk? Yeah. And it's very drastic impact. So, yeah, we'll be able to tease that out and, and find out what the effect is. So yeah. even though the data is tied to the provider, you will be able to find out what happens if the remaining person is not the provider? Yes, and that's what the effort I've been going through recently is, um, is trying to link back to, to follow team membership across months to say, okay, so in this month they got a new provider, so that provider's going to have the team's data going forward. Who was the provider before? Because they're going to have the data going back. Um, and so I've got that data. It's just a matter of matching up the records so that the former provider's data that captures the team performance is there for the earlier months. And then just that the performance of the same team but linked to that new provider is there for the latter months. So you have a hypothesis about that, or are you looking at that as a control variable? Um, as, at what specifically? At the role of who remains. Yes, that's that's being looked at specifically. So yes, that's included. So. Can I just make a comment? I think I'm really impressed with your description of the VA hospital and the fact that they've got these criteria you know, it's kind of changing a lot of my criticism negative you know, <laughs> the first place, you know. That's part of the deep It's a hard one to solve, and I think it's okay. It's, I mean, it's, and and so, honestly, it's, it, they're working very hard and, and doing hard work, and it's, it's great to be there, but I mean, it's true they, they've got some struggles, and, and there's definitely things to fix. So. But it seems to me that there are a number of other uh, criteria that ought to at some point be considered by someone, and that's, uh, you know, the, the impact of teams on the quality of life of the team members. Um, the levels of stress if you're you know, part of two teams, you know, it seems to me that the role conflict you could face could be enormous. And then another variable is um, how, how patients feel about you know, in terms of patient satisfaction. I mean, being able timely access to being able to get in and follow up, you know, I think that the team structure ought to dramatically improve feelings of, uh, of patient satisfaction. And so even if you didn't find any other variable that, that demonstrated that that was a benefit, the fact that patients were treated more as an individual and knowing that they had a team that was focused on their well-being would justify what it is you're doing. So, so um, you know, a bio index that's the predictor, right? But yeah, if you're right, at, at outcomes, there's a lot more that could definitely be looked at, um, especially from the individual perception level of the patients and also the members of the team. Um, so we, we gave a nationwide you know, presentation online to a lot of people on the VA uh, last week. One of the greatest things we heard afterwards was people saying, wow, that's really interesting. I've got some outcomes I'd like you to look at, which is one of the golden words you can hear as a researcher, right? Yes, I'd be glad to evaluate those outcomes. And one of them they mentioned actually was patient satisfaction, something that, that we've not been able to get access to um, but with their permission, we're optimistic we can and maybe start investigating some of those outcomes. So we're hopeful we'll be able to. I don't know if anybody suggested this, but um, one, one other thing that may be interesting is to look at the prevalence of medical malpractice patients in, in, the, team, in the team setting, and also on the other end, how medical malpractice actions affect team dynamics, both, both immediately and in the future as physicians leave and, you know, hide cases or whatever are, are known to, to the VA, how that, how that affects the future team. Yeah, yeah. So when you have some of those counterproductive behaviors that are, you know, unethical in a lot of ways, what effect does that have going forward? Does, is there a lingering effect? Do you have this kind of major reaction the team pulls it in a different direction? Or even more than just unethical, just, just negligent. But there's probably an incredible number of unobtrusive data measures that, I'm not sure what they probably data that's just sitting there that could be used to, you know, to add to your analysis, but I don't know what they are. Yeah. You know, 
hope so. If so, we're looking for it. We I mean, would like to see what the end next time. So, um, for your knowledge, in case you're not watching the talk, the time is up. So, I mean, I don't want to keep you if you don't want to. I know I've, I've got a meeting coming up as well with uh, Jeff. Thank you so much, though, for coming. I, I appreciate the comments and the feedback. I'm looking forward to further communication as well. Um, again, this is a project in development. We're looking to make it the best it can be. Um, you know, we found at least, in my start, coming from an HR background, I'm very interested in the practical effects. Um, looking at making actual impact. So for me, this has been a fantastic project to see ways we can actually impact lives. Um, Research-wise as well, though, I'd like to make an impact, and I think we have some interesting theories that we can test and, and decide, you know, what is it that actually works in this type of setting. So thank you so much for your time and for coming, and thank you for I'd like to see Kristen for